everybody and welcome to this week's Everton show. There's no game to focus on, of course, this weekend, but that doesn't mean to say there's going to be some time off for the players because looming on the horizon next Wednesday is, of course, Leicester City in the Premier League. And I'm delighted to be joined by Phil Jagielka. Does it help that we've got a midweek Premier League game next week? It, it, it gives the players something to focus on during a blank FA Cup weekend. Yeah, definitely. You know, it had been too much of a break between the last game, so uh, delighted to have a home game coming up again. Good game against Leicester and we can hopefully get back to winning ways and, and start getting a bit more momentum again. Earlier this week, you and I were on the gantry at Goodison Park on a windy, cold night to watch the under-23s. It was a good win for the 23s. Did you enjoy the experience? Yeah, I loved it. Obviously, it was nice to see Seamus come back uh, mm. put in a solid 60 minutes, but to be up there, obviously, with yourself and <laughs> having a little bit of fun watching the game and doing a little bit of uh, commentary work was was good and something I look to do again. It was a nice game for Seamus, wasn't it? Yeah, it wasn't too difficult. I think um, the 23s have probably played against harder teams and, and a young, very young Portsmouth team that, that they put out. But they had to still go and do the job. And to be fair, from the first minute to the last, was pretty much in control of the game. And hopefully that'll give him a little bit of confidence going forward in that competition. There was one minute over on the far side when he slid in for a challenge and my heart was in my mouth. You were probably expecting him to do it because you've been in the same situation yourself. But would that have been a big psychological barrier for him to get over? Yeah, I think so. I spoke to him afterwards, funnily enough. I said I enjoyed your meaty challenge that was probably not needed <laughs> on the touchline. But he just looked, looked at me and laughed and said it, that was obviously for himself. I think he uh, told the lad that he, he nearly lifted into to Rosehead, you know, sort of half apologised for doing it. But uh, as soon as he got over that, that's him done. Dusted, he's been flying into challenges and stuff in training. So that box is uh, well and truly ticked now and onwards and upwards for Seamus. Everybody at the football club delighted to see Seamus Coleman back in action and we caught up with the Irish defender after the game. Yeah, just getting out there, getting the kit on again, rolling the socks up, getting the shin pads on, getting my boots on again. Just uh, feeling like a footballer and just walking out there was a was a great feeling. You wouldn't have known that you'd been out for so long, a crunching tackle after 20 minutes. Yeah, um, you know, that was more for me than the young lad. I, I said that to him at the time. I said that was more for me than you and he was fine with it. Um, you know, going back to my interviews at the start, the new tackles and stuff like that was never going to be a bother. And I think it was just more for the couple of fans that were here to show them that there's no psychological effect. If I can ask you about James, obviously yeah. a big blow for him, just as he'd come back from injury himself. And obviously he's going to find it quite difficult uh, for the next couple of months. Yeah, he is. Uh, obviously it was heartbreaking for me to see not nothing to do with my own injury, just because... Um, because he's a, a very close friend and uh, someone that I really admire, and um, it's, it was it wasn't nice to see. And you know, he will be back from it. Uh, I suppose uh, my first interviews have changed a bit. I uh, I want to go out there now every week and do as well as I possibly can to show James that you will be back, you will be fine. So um, every, every time I step out of Goodison, every time I, I step out of training, I'll be I'll be doing all I can to be as best as I can be, so he can see on a Saturday watch a match of the day or whatever that uh, there's there's a, a way back, and uh, I've no doubt James will be okay. How has Seamus been around the place since he's been injured? Uh, surprisingly, really positive. I, I say surprisingly, that's not because he's not a positive person. <laughs> it's just you know normally when you have you know you're going to be out for a long period, you know you do have your sort of dark days and you do get down, but. I think uh, the physios would say he must be up there, one of the, the best patients they've had. Uh, probably a lot better than I was when I was out for that <laughs> time. But uh, not really positive. He's had the close season where everyone obviously was away from him and he got on with his, his early stage rehab. And then ever since then, he's had people to bounce off and, and get through it. But he said there's nothing like playing football. You know, he's delighted, even though obviously there's only a couple hundred people watching it. Good as the other night. It was, it was nice for him to get back on the, on the turf and he, he can't wait to get going again. It's always great for a player to be injured to know that there's other players within the squad who have been through it, the likes of yourself, Yannick Balassi, for example, and you're now going to need to be there for James McCarthy as well. Yeah, it's nice to obviously be able to talk to them and, and see how they feel. Obviously, Funes again, he's been out for a little mm. while, um, but you know, disappointed. You know, for James, he, you know, honest lad makes a tackle and, and unfortunately comes away with a with a broken leg. But you know, the operation's gone well. Um, you know, the realism's probably hit him now. He knows it's a a long, slow road to recovery, but thankfully he can look not too far away to his best mate, yeah. who's who's dealt with it really well. And at the moment, no signs of of it going to uh, hinder him going forward. And hopefully, that's going to be something similar for Jamesy. Will that'll be a big help for Jamesy, won't it? The fact that Seamus has been through it and Seamus is back now playing. Yeah, that's it's not really the right word to use, but perfect timing mm -hmm. to see. Obviously, the 
<coughs> from sort of day one to, to, to get into play again. Um, so Seamus will be there for him as, as James he was for, for Shea. So uh, it's a great relationship they've got off the pitch as well. Friendship, great bond and um, I'm sure you'll need him for those are times when you know you, you feel things aren't going quite right. It was terrific to see Seamus bombing up and down the right wing, wasn't it, in that distinctive style of his. And it was an easy game for him to come into because Everton were in control from the very first whistle. Yeah, we, we dominated the game. It was a it was a good game for Seamus to, to get his fitness in. I don't think he was under too much you know pressure defensively, but still made his runs, still made his screeches down there, you know, asking for the ball down the down the wing. And like you say, it's it's fantastic to see him. He's always got a smile on his face, but it seems to be that little bit bigger when he's playing football. And hopefully, uh, we see a happy Seamus throughout the rest of the season. Nathan Broadhead took his goal well, didn't he? Yeah, great ball from from Fraser, but yeah, great composure. I told him he probably should have had another one with his head. <laughs> he, he laughed at me, but uh, the boys, like I say, a good bunch of boys at their 23s, and confidence is starting to come back, and that's the main thing. And um, a few lads did themselves no harm. Obviously, the performances uh, the other night. And you made Basala Sambu your man of the match because he scored two goals, one of which was a, a perler. Yeah, I think if, if I'd have not given it him, it would have been a bit harsh. There was a couple of players that ran him quite close, but uh, you know the, the first goal was obviously exceptional. And the second goal summed up his night. He worked tirelessly throughout and he deserved to, to make the goalkeeper make a mistake and then slot it home. Well, let's have a little break from conversation now and hear from Gilfie Sigurdsson. He sat down in the My First chair early this week. Um, I didn't actually get my driving license until I was about 19, 20, so it was an Audi Q7. Kind of silver, it was the Brazilian Ronaldo, it had something to do with his initials or his number or something. Playing football in football in the garden or inside with my my brother. Yeah, he's older. So he had the ball and I was trying to get up. <laughs> Theo Walcott. I think one of my first games in the Premier League. Um, and we got our shots shirts with him. So that's um, I think one of my first ones. Uh, I've normally sung Stand By Me, um, it's quite easy, I can kind of talk through it. I don't know, it must have been something back home in Iceland um, for doing something wrong. Let's just leave it at that. Gilfie's coming into a little bit of form, Jags, and he showed that he's got an eye for a goal, which we knew anyway. Yeah, we we definitely knew that. We knew he's obviously a, a great set piece taker, and he takes his chances when he gets one. Struggled to probably find those um, moments in the early part. You know, he probably had a disrupted pre-season. You know, the bids being accepted, not being accepted, going on tours, not going on tours, and came towards probably not in the you know full match fitness mm. uh, condition he would have hoped, and you know came towards when we poss possibly were in our worst period as well. So it was it was a difficult start for for Gilf, but. Turn the corner. He's always put a, a shift in, and I think that's starting to pay off now. He's took his, you know, took a couple of his goals fantastically well. Obviously, set up by some uh, people nicely, <laughs> but um, no, great lads have around the place as well. And you know, it's nice to see when, when uh, you know, the goals start flying in, the assists and stuff. And um, it's nice to see he's finally settling in, and hopefully, uh, can be the linchpin for us uh, moving forward. What were you doing on the right hand side of the penalty area in the Merseyside derby? Uh, you know, often in training and stuff, I make silly runs, so it sort of went, went for one at that time. Quite a few people have asked me the same question, and uh, there's no logical explanation except for uh, I was back in the uh, playground as a kid and running down the wing, enjoying myself. Somebody else who's enjoying himself around the place is Jordan Pickford, who settled into the football club really well and is performing well on the pitch as well, as indicated by his award, England Under 21 Player of the Year. Yeah, it's great for, for the boys to get something like that. Obviously, Jordan's a Smashing lad, lively, bubbly, as most goalkeepers are. And um, it's nice, he's, he's pulled off some great saves, he's, he's match winning performances at, at a time, or you know, ended up keeping us clean sheets with some fantastic um, saves and decisions and things like that. Um, you, know, he's, you forget how young he is, you know, he mm. came with a big price tag and everyone you know, wasn't too sure whether it was, it was too early for him to, to sort of cost that much money, but 
you know, the way I see it, it's getting in quite cheap and hopefully he'll be here for a long, long time and, uh, you know, can put himself down with the fantastic goalkeeper this club I've, I've had before and he's started off pretty well. He certainly has. And that's just about it for part one of this week's programme. After the break, we'll hear plenty more from Phil Jagielka. We'll also hear from Leighton Baines and we'll hear from Adrian Heath. Welcome back to part two of this week's Everton show. Now, a recent and most welcome visitor here to USM Finch Farm was Adrian Heath. And she was very much a part of the glory days here of the mid-80s. He's currently coaching in the MLS with Minnesota United. And I caught up with him to ask him how the inaugural season for his team had gone. Started very badly. Um, wondered what I'd let myself in for the first few weeks. But fortunately enough, and I'm glad to say that we got better as the year went on. And... Uh, the second half of the season gives us a lot of optimism moving forward. So it's it's never easy, first year expansion team, bringing in 28 new players in the space of about five or six weeks. But, uh, you know, it has its challenges. But in the end, we, we ended up, uh, you know, we, we made ourselves credible in the end and um, really looking forward to the off-season and now making one or two additions to improve it moving forward. Soccer, of course, has a, a tough battle, doesn't it, to make the very back pages of the USA papers mm. because it's up against popular traditional sports. Well, it does. You know, the NFL is huge. College, American football. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. I, I think there's a, I think there's something like 30 colleges that play over 75, 80 thousand people every week. So that gives you an idea of the popularity of that sport. But the game, soccer. Football, as we know it, is getting better, and uh, I think we average now more than the basketball and the hockey crowds. So it's moving in the right direction. What have you made of Everton this season? It's been a, it's been a strange one so well, far, hasn't it? I don't think anybody saw the start. You know what, what we had coming. Um, obviously, with the outlay and everything, and the optimism of what had happened the year before. So, you know, in the, in the end, it's probably inevitable what happened. But you know, I think that Sam's come in, obviously, giving everybody a lift, giving everybody a boost. And, um, you know, I think now everybody can settle down and the team can start to play the football that we all know they're capable of. And you've uh, played against Sammy Lee a few times, haven't you? Yeah, I'm old enough to have played against Sam as well, big <laughs> Sam Allardyce, so that tells you. No, but, you know, obviously, I've had a really good day there today with the, with the guys and um, it's good to see them both. They're both really happy and excited to be here. And um, I think you can see with Sammy's enthusiasm on the side of the on the on the field that I can assure every Evertonian that this guy is so determined to do well here, as he's as he's been everywhere he's been, and and I've got great admiration for what Sam Allardyce has done. So I think the club's in good hands. Talking of the MLS Major League Soccer House, Tim Howard, have you spoke to T How lately? Yeah, he popped over not long ago uh, to to sort a few final bits and bobs of his old house out. So I met with him for. A for a bite to eat and yeah he's still loving it and um, taking a bit of a a bigger role at the club you know not only playing but you know the background and trying to I think they're having a bit of a, a new squad and stuff like that uh, purpose-built training grounds and all sorts like that mm. so I think uh, you know Colorado are, are kicking on and he's delighted to be part of it. Great move for him wasn't it to go back there and just see out the twilight days of his career. Yeah he was always passionate about American obviously uh, football mm. you know he what, 130 appearances or mm. whatever he made for his national team so he'd never shirked his responsibilities that way so I think to go back and, and give a bit back and and get a bit more publicity and thing like that um, he'd done his time over in England you know fantastic years here and it was it was probably the right move at the right time is the MLS something that you would ever consider in a few years time good <laughs> a good few years time <laughs> not sure how long you expect me to keep playing for does but um, it's different. I think with Tim being American um, and a goalkeeper, you know, the MLS looks for a certain type of player and all sorts. I'm mm. not, I'm not sure a centre back, at 35 years plus is is high on their uh, list of uh, agendas. But uh, I'm quite happy as I am at the moment. You know, um, there's no family or anything to go back for in America, so uh, happy trying to get in the Everton team week in week <laughs> out. And uh, I've not looked uh, that far ahead really. Try and add to your 368 first-team appearances. One more, and you draw a level with Kevin Sheedy, by the way. Did you ever think you'd get to not far off 400 appearances when you first arrived at the club? Because there's uh, some going. Not at all. You know, I think, you know, when I played previously at, at Sheffield, you have the championship, the cup runs. Uh, there seems to be a lot more games week in, week out. And then, obviously, as you get older and Premier League's a bit less, and then, obviously, the, the amount of players you're competing with and the quality and stuff, you, you know, in my 11th season to have average sort of 30, 32, 33 games a season or whatever it works out at is, is good going so uh, you know proudest punch to have got to that number but 
hopefully not quite finished. Hopefully there's a few more appearances and I go past Sheeds and then hunt down the next one and then <laughs> and then go from there, really. You're only 60-odd goals behind him as well. Oh, yeah, I thought so. I didn't think I'd be quite up there with that. <laughs> Ten years or so, and every week when we're on the television, the commentators still get it wrong. It's actually not Jagielka, is it? Yeah, we have this conversation quite a lot. It's, it, is, it is my name. It's my football name. It's what uh, I've been used to getting called. I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't pull anyone up. I would, don't get frustrated. And obviously, it's pronounced Yagelka when I have to do something mm. into camera, and yeah. they ask me my name. I'm not going to say it, say it wrong. But uh, as football, you know, it's my, my stage name, if you like. Um, commentators, you know, Jagielka is absolutely fine. It's what it's what everyone expects. You know, me to turn turn my head round to. So uh, Yags doesn't sound exactly. Way, it sounds it? rubbish. So uh, <laughs> calling myself Jags, Jagielka, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> Well, somebody else who's been around for a long time is, of course, Leighton Baines, another player well over 300 first-team appearances for the club. He's been speaking to us about his favourite Goodison Park memories, and it's all part of the season ticket campaign because next Wednesday, 31st of January, is the deadline for season ticket holders to renew for 2018-19 by using the 12-month direct debit scheme. One of those traditional grounds that are becoming rare in top flight football now. Epitomises, you know, what you associate with, you know, that old English style. It's a ground I grew up going past on my way in and out of town many times on the bus and whatnot. So, um, you know, it's got some nostalgia for me. Walking out to Zed Cars is always very special. Probably, honestly, resonates more when I'm watching. I get goosebumps when I'm watching. We've experienced it down the years many times, you know, being in, in close games and you know, when you do get that back and support and you can just feel, you can feel it, that you know, that being willed on to, to get the winner or, you know, whether, you know, you're seeing a game out, you can really feel that um, and then, you know, when, it, when it's there, it can, it can make a huge difference. What's Bainesy been like about the place? Has he been a bit more of a bear with a sore head while he's been injured? Uh, I wouldn't go that far. I'd say he's just been a little bit quieter, and he's normally quite quiet anyway. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's been frustrating. He's still been uh, super positive, you know, around the changing room, especially game time and stuff like that. But I think day to day, he's itching to get back on the pitch and and help us uh, move forward. It must be doubly frustrating for someone like Bainesy to pick up a semi long term injury just as a new manager arrives. Yeah, well. <laughs> You know, that's, that's the worst possible timing, isn't it? Mm. You know, thankfully, I'm sure the manager has a pretty good idea what Bainesy will offer to the team, you know, when he comes back. But like I say, the first thing you want to do as soon as the manager comes in is train well, you know, uh, put yourself forward to play and then not lose your place. So uh, he, he'll be, well, add to the sort of the, the wound that he's got, obviously, without playing. But um, I'm sure when he gets back, he'll be bombing up and down that left side and, you know, making sure the manager picks him. Does the players still look upon Big Sam as still a new manager, or is he well embedded into it now? Uh, I think, I think yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I think players that have played pretty much every game will look at him as, as being here a while, but the ones that are still looking to, to cement you know, more game time and stuff, which is probably about 60-70% of the team, uh, will be still trying to impress as you do with the new manager. So, same with the coaching staff. Uh, they've settled in really well, but it is still uh, quite early, day, early days. Let's have a quick look at some action from the under-18s who edged a five-goal thriller against West Bromwich Albion recently. A good win for the 18s, gets them right back on track. Yeah, it's nice, you know, when the, the club from obviously the bottom to the top, you know, with age groups are doing well and, and it does spread. You know, you, you see the vibe around the place. Um, everyone seems to be walking around with a, with a, with a smile rather than head down. So uh, it's nice to see the young lads, you know, putting pressure on. You know, the 23s are obviously performing a little bit better again now, so, you know, it's a knock-on effect. And then 23s will be knocking on the first team yeah. door. and That's the way it has to be. Yeah, well, you know, it is the way a, um, a successful football club of this size uh, needs to be. Anthony Gordon scored a fantastic goal against West Brom, and he's had a little taste of first-team action over in Cyprus. Well, same again. It was the way, obviously, if you were registered low knees and all sorts, it was the most complicated way of picking a squad to go over to 
to Cyprus, but fantastic. You know, if you're performing well for the team, whether it be the 16s, 18s, 23s, first team, you deserve a chance. And, um, you know, it's nice to have seen those boys that potentially wouldn't have been able to be in the squad if it wasn't for certain aspects, but, you know, they must have performed extra special to, to be given a nudge or a, or a, or a sort of a, a push out the door towards Cyprus. Let's finish with the first team. Leicester City at Goodison Park Wednesday night. It's a big game, isn't it? Yeah, th most games at the moment are big for us. We need to, to stay in the top half. You know, we don't want to be looking over our shoulder, so it's all about getting points. Yeah, it was a disappointing one point against West Brom, but definitely better than coming away with nothing. And if we can pick the three points up against Leicester, you know, four points from the two games, it puts us back on track a little bit and then the momentum gets us going for the, for the few games that are coming up afterwards. It's another game to look forward to at Goodison Park. Everton against Leicester City next Wednesday in the Premier League. As always, we'll have full audio commentary from that game. And that's just about it for this week's programme. My thanks enormously to Phil Jagielka for joining us. Thank you for watching. Please do join us again in seven days' time for another Everton show. You've been watching The Everton Show on YouTube. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sure you have. Don't forget to subscribe and that way you can catch every single future episode.